The following is a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. We hope that you find today's lesson presented by our minister, Dr. Joseph Becker, informative, insightful, and inspirational. Last week I demonstrated to you that salvation is a continuum, a process made up of no fewer than 21 elements, 21 components, and that justification is but one of those elements, one of those components. Not only that, but what we receive in justification is imputed righteousness, reckoned righteousness, which as I understand it, is the preemptive work of God in which he extends his righteousness to sinners as a matter of executive privilege. The righteousness is not actual righteousness, but nominal righteousness. As Paul tells us in Romans 4, 1 through 8, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham had been justified by works, he would have something to boast about, though not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. But to the one who does no works, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also said of the blessings of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, blessed is he whose indictments have been lifted and whose sins have been covered over. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Now verses 7 and 8 here, as I have just cited them, are translated not from the Septuagint, but from the Hebrew Old Testament. Because here the Greek, in my opinion, is potentially misleading. What David says in the Hebrew in Psalm 32.1 is not, as many translations have it, blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered. No, what David says literally here is, blessed is he whose transgressions are lifted away and whose sins are hidden from sight. And the idea is not one of the remission of sin, but of amnesty from the consequences of sin. Blessed is he against whom no indictment is brought. Blessed is he whose sins are covered over. And the word that's translated covered over there literally means to plump in the sense of to fill up hollows. And it is evocative of tracks and the snow being covered over by fresh snowfall. Have you ever heard of a cover story after a scandal being called a snow job? Well, references like that have been around for a long time. And in Psalm 32, 1 through 2, that's the language David uses to describe God's behavior when he imputes not iniquity to a man. He hides that person's sins from his own eyes and withholds any indictment against him. And according to Paul, the Lord does this by imputing his own righteousness to that person. When Abraham believed, God imputed his faith to him as righteousness. But God did not make Abraham righteous. Rather, he imputed his own righteousness to Abraham. As I have demonstrated to you in other lessons, justification on its own without sanctification would be nothing more than a legal fiction. Because Abraham received the rights and privileges of righteousness, but not its substance. This is what I think is meant in Hebrews 11, where we read that Abraham was justified by his faith, yet he did not receive the promise. Because the promise, as I understand it, is the promise Peter speaks of in Acts 2. The actual righteousness that comes to us with baptism for the forgiveness of sin, and the reception of the Holy Spirit, and with the Spirit, grace, and abiding in Christ, even as he abides in us, which abidance perfects us, producing actual righteousness in us. But that kind of change is not produced directly by justification. No, as I told you last week, justification, as I understand it, does not produce native righteousness in its recipients. Growing up in the church, we had a preacher who was an aspiring professor of psychology. And he taught us that the knowledge of our justification, our awareness of it, produces a cognitive dissonance in our psyches. Because we know that we have been justified, but we also know that we don't deserve it. And the disconnect between what we have been given and what we ought to have been given causes us psychological pain in the form of shame. And in order to relieve that pain, the conscience compels us to repent of our sins and live better lives. Well, hockpucky. Repentance is evidence of a change in one's resident righteousness. And justification does not contribute to one's resident righteousness. 
Repentance is not a product of justification. Repentance is a product of faith. Go back and read Genesis 15. When God made his good faith guarantees to Abraham, Abraham did not respond by promising God that he'd be a better person. As a matter of fact, there's no evidence in Genesis 15 that Abraham was even aware of his justification. Now, the narrator of that report is aware of it, but by all accounts, Abraham wasn't. Indeed, if you examine Abraham's life from that point to his death in Genesis 25, what you'll find is that there's very little evidence of anything that we would recognize as good character. Except that, whenever God spoke, he listened. And whatever God told him to do, he did. No, in Genesis 15, the only sin that Abraham repented of, as far as I can tell, it's the sin of disbelief. And that repentance is not a product of his justification. It's a product of his faith. Faith is that turning point in which we begin to participate in our own sanctification. There's nothing any of us ever did to earn our justification. It is a gift from God given in exchange for faith, which is also a gift from God. I made no contribution to my election, my predestination, the providence of my life circumstances, my conversion, my evangelization, my ability to hear and understand the word as it was preached to me, my faith, or my justification. These were all given to me without my assistance, cooperation, or consent. But when I received my faith, coterminous with my justification, I began to participate willingly in the process of my sanctification. As Paul tells us in Philippians 2, 12 through 13, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Nevertheless, in Scripture, in the Word of God, justification gets equal billing with sanctification. As a matter of fact, under those names, under those monikers, justification gets more prominent billing than does sanctification because justification is mentioned some 40 times in the New Testament, whereas sanctification is named only about 30 times. The New Testament tells us of no fewer than 21 factors that go into the salvation of all the elect, and justification is but one of those factors. And yet, justification is featured so prominently in the New Testament that there are millions of believers who hold the conviction that once they attain justification, their salvation is complete. But why is that? I mean, clearly, the lion's share of the work of salvation is accomplished by sanctification. So why is justification featured so prominently in the New Testament? Why does it get equal billing with sanctification? Well, because... Justification is the sine qua non of salvation. It is the without which not of salvation. Now, to be fair, it isn't the only indispensable component of salvation, but it does play a unique role in salvation for which there is no substitute. Because though justification is but one ingredient among many in the recipe of salvation, without it, the other 20 elements would be set at naught, because about half of them would be rendered irrelevant and the other half would be rendered impossible. Because the inaugural elements of salvation, election, predestination, providence, conversion, evangelization, hearing, faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, would all be pointless, at least for us, if they did not lead to the consummate elements of salvation. The remission of sins, catechesis, regeneration, reconciliation, transformation, purification, perfection, glorification, redemption, and adoption. And the linchpin that connects inaugural salvation to consummate salvation is justification. Justification is the keystone without which neither side of the arch can stand. Because if the Father did not count us as righteous, the Son would not be free to treat us as righteous. That is the nature of the divine bureaucracy. You know, this week in the Yapa Valley Choral Society, we ran into a problem with the musicians that we've been planning to bring in from the UK for a performance next May. Because they need a certain kind of visa to enter the US to work as guest artists, but they can't file for it. We have to file a petition on their behalf, which petition must be accompanied by a fee of $460. However, the payment of that fee does not guarantee approval. 
All the fee does is to give us the right to ask. All the fee does is give us the right to be heard. It is the gateway to officially enrolling in the process. Well, while the analogy is imperfect, that is not unlike the role that justification plays in salvation, because justification gives us the right to become children of God. That's what the disciple Jesus loved tells us in John 1, 9 through 13. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own creation, and his own creatures did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children who would be born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. To all who believe, the Lord grants justification. And justification affords us the right to receive baptism, and with it the forgiveness of sins, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and the indwelling of grace, and all of these things wrought by the catechesis of grace. But in the absence of justification, Christ is not free to grant us these things. As Paul tells us in Galatians 2, 16-17, Now we know that a person is justified not by works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Accordingly, we who put our faith in Christ Jesus are thereupon justified by the faith of Christ, and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. If this were not so, then we who seek to be right-wised in Christ would be doing so as convicts who have been found guilty of sin, making Christ the servant of sin. May it never be so. Now, you'll notice that Paul uses the word justified differently in verse 17 of Galatians 2 than in verse 16. In verse 16, he's clearly talking about imputed righteousness, which is amnesty, whereas in verse 17, he's talking about seeking actual righteousness in Christ, which is to be set right or to be right-wised. But don't get distracted by that today. The point for today's lesson is that according to Paul, were it not for the right granted to us in the imputation of the Father's righteousness to us, the Son would not be free to grant us actual righteousness. Because doing so would make him the servant of sin, a contingency which Paul rejects in the strongest possible language, saying, may it never be. Or as it is rendered in the King James Version, God forbid. Were it not for justification, Christ would not be free to sanctify us. But we have been justified, and according to Paul, justification is irrevocable. Romans 8, 31-34, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? How could he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for our sakes, not also graciously give us all the same things he is giving to him? Who shall indict God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? And justification is granted on the basis of faith, and faith alone. That's why I've been telling you that God, quite apparently, has a great deal of confidence in faith, and that we ought to have more confidence in faith than we do. Because historically, the church has been very slow to recognize faith when we see it. We don't believe our own eyes when we see it. And consequently, we tend to require that faith be substantiated by proofs. In Pentecostal traditions, faith has to be substantiated by speaking in tongues. In Calvinist traditions, faith is substantiated by a demonstration of knowledge of the faith, professed adherence to the Westminster Confession of Faith. In Hensley and Holiness churches, faith is substantiated by the handling of snakes. In our tradition, we ask that people substantiate their faith by being baptized. Now, I am persuaded that all who believe ought to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins unto the reception of the Holy Spirit and into the fulfillment of the promise because according to the Bible, baptism accomplishes all these things and more. But one thing I can assure you that baptism does not do any more than speaking in tongues, one's confession of faith, or the handling of snakes do. Baptism does not substantiate one's faith. Because faith does not require substantiation. No, according to the Bible, faith substantiates itself. 
because faith has its substance in itself. That's what the author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, just stop and dwell on that for a few minutes, because the claim that's made in this statement is no small claim. The Greek word there, this translated substance, is the word hypostasis, and it is perfectly translated by the word substance. The word hypostasis is a compound word made up of two words, hupo, which means under, and istemi, which means to stand. And it literally means that which stands under. And the word substance corresponds directly to it. Because sub means under, and stands means a standing place. And it literally means that which stands under. And as hypostasis is used in ancient Greek, it means to stand under. To resist, in the structural sense of internal strength which resists opposing forces. That which endures, that which remains the same to come into existence, to originate the power of existence, foundation, substructure, the substantial nature of a thing, actual existence, reality, substantial existence, the real nature or essence of a thing, the title deed of real property, hexiety, whatness, or ergasia. And according to the Bible, that's what faith is. Faith does not need to be substantiated by anything outside of itself. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the hypostasis of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. And the word evidence is from the Greek word alexos, which means to cross-examine. It isn't doubt that cross-examines things not seen. Faith cross-examines things not seen. And more importantly, things not seen do not put one's faith to the test. Faith puts things not seen to the test. As I told you about a year ago in lesson number 383 in this series, Outside In or Inside Out, those who believe without seeing will be happier than those who require further evidence. That's the lesson of Doubting Thomas. But don't imagine for a minute that external evidence substantiates our faith. It does not. It may make us feel better, and it may be persuasive or compelling to non-believers, but it does not give substance to our faith, because faith has its substance in itself. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And when I say substance, I mean substance. Now, I preached on this not too long ago, but it bears repeating in John 4, 19-24, in relaying to us the report of Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well, John tells us, The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now all of my life, what I've been told that that means is that under the new covenant, there are no holy places because God is spirit, and spirits have no substance, no extension in time or space. Therefore, God being spirit isn't anywhere, he's everywhere. But beloved, that can't possibly be the right way to interpret this passage, because the Bible in other places tells us otherwise. According to the Bible, spirits are not immaterial, and God, who is spirit, is not immaterial. In Daniel 10, we find Daniel at prayer. And he has been at prayer for three weeks without a reply. But then starting in verse 12 of Daniel 10, the reply comes, and it is delivered personally by the archangel Gabriel. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard. And I have come because of your words. 
The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was being detained there with the kings of Persia. But now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. Now, this passage gives us rare and valuable insight into the inner workings of the spiritual realm, the inner workings of the realm of spiritual beings. And the picture it reveals is not one of a place or of beings that have no substance. Because what Gabriel tells Daniel reveals that the angels and the spiritual realm that they occupy are substantive, and in a sense that corresponds almost directly with the sense in which we and the realm that we occupy are substantive. Daniel has been praying for 21 days, and Gabriel comes to him and says, from the first day that you began speaking, your prayer has been heard. And this indicates that Gabriel, as he went about his business in the spiritual realm, was aware of time and of the passage of time. And according to what Gabriel says next, it sounds very much like he is experiencing the passage of time in very much the same way that Daniel is experiencing it. Because Gabriel reports that the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood him 21 days. Well, if the spiritual realm isn't substantive, what is 21 days to Gabriel? Why should he even be aware of the passage of time while he's fighting with the prince of Persia? If the spiritual realm is completely free from the strictures of time and space, then Daniel shouldn't have had to have waited at all for his answer, because no time should have been passing while whatever was happening in the spirit world was happening. That is, if time is merely a construct, if time really is an artificial template placed over the expanse of eternity for our benefit to accommodate our limited capacity to grasp reality, and if, as so many insist, the spiritual realm is not subject to time. But, beloved, think about it. Because unless we assume either that Gabriel is deluded or that as a co-conspirator with God in the ledger domain of time, he is deliberately feeding Daniel misinformation, then we probably ought to take him at his word in Daniel 10. And according to his report, he experienced the passage of those 21 days very much the same way that Daniel did. In real time. Not only that, but Gabriel goes on to say that the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood him 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help him, for he was being detained there with the king of Persia. The reason that Gabriel's answer to Daniel's prayer was delayed, according to the archangel, was because Gabriel was occupied for those 21 days. And he wasn't just occupied for a period of time, he was also occupied in a particular place. Daniel was somewhere, and Gabriel was somewhere else. Well, where? Well, we don't know exactly, but we do know that wherever it was, the prince of Persia was there too. Now, most people understand this prince of Persia to be some demonic spirit or an angel of Satan who is in some sense controlling the earthly ruler of Persia, and I think that's probably right. And what Gabriel tells us about this prince of Persia is that he is somewhere, and that wherever that somewhere is, Gabriel had to be there in order to engage him. He couldn't do it from where Daniel was. He could not do battle with the prince of Persia unless he was where the prince of Persia was. As a matter of fact, he had to wait in that location until Michael came to his relief, because Michael was also somewhere, somewhere other than where Gabriel and the prince of Persia were. And Michael had to depart from wherever that was in order to go to wherever Gabriel was so that Gabriel could leave that location and go to wherever Daniel was. And that tag team effort took 21 days to accomplish. Now, beloved, I don't know how anybody can read that and conclude that spiritual things do not have substance. If Gabriel's report to Daniel in Daniel 10 is accurate, then it can only be that spiritual things do have substance. Now, those of you who have listened to me for a long time know this, and you know that this is something about which I am deeply convicted. In 2 Corinthians 9.4, Paul says, For if any Macedonians were to come with me and find you unprepared, we would show ourselves, and might I say you would show yourselves, unworthy in this substance, which is our boast. 
And I spent five years of my life proving to some of the keenest minds in the world of biblical academia that the substance Paul has in mind in this passage is grace, and that he isn't using a figure of speech when he refers to grace as a substance. And after being awarded my doctoral degree on the basis of that study, I published my findings in a book, which book is available at the Bud Werner Memorial Library here in Seaboat Springs. Or if you'd like your own copy, it's available from Edwin Mellon Press for the princely sum of now $299.95. They're making a killing. I'm not getting anything from that. But, but, <laughs> but I digress. My point is that there is ample evidence in Scripture that spiritual things are not insubstantial, but in fact and indeed have real substance. Which substance is discernible to God and to Christ, and quite apparently was discernible to the apostles as well. Now I know for a fact, and indeed have proven as a biblical certainty, that grace is a spiritual substance with spiritual attributes. What I'm telling you this morning is that according to Hebrews 11.1, 1, the same is true of faith. And though I have not studied this as thoroughly as I have studied grace, I can tell you that just a cursory review of the New Testament seems to confirm that finding. Because according to Luke 5, 17 through 20, faith can be seen. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Now you could read that and say, Well, he saw evidence of their faith. And that is a reasonable intuition, but the scripture doesn't say that. What it says is that he saw their faith. And according to Romans 12, 3 through 6, faith can be measured. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has dealt to him. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them in proportion to our faith. Beloved, the reason why God has confidence in faith is because to him, faith isn't ineffable. To him, it's a known quantity. To him, it's a discernible hexiety. To him, it is not a concept or an idea or a stance or a conviction or an opinion. Rather, faith is something. Something with substance. That's why I dedicated two whole lessons to re-examining James 2. Because in James 2.1, the brother of Jesus tells us, My brethren, when it comes to apprehending the countenances of men, you have not been given the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes on for the whole rest of the chapter to explain that Jesus has perceptive abilities that we don't have. And among those abilities is the power to discern the faith of others. And that since we do not have the powers to discern that Jesus has, we would do well to refrain from attempting to ascertain the faith of others. Because while we can see faith, which is demonstrated in works, we cannot see faith proper. No, as far as we can see, faith without works is dead. But Christ has better vision than we do. God has better vision than we do. And the Lord can see faith whether it is accompanied by works or not. And he trusts his own eyes. And what I'm suggesting to you this morning is simply this, that perhaps we would do well if we learn to trust the Lord's eyes along with him. That's my lesson for today. This has been a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ. We hope that you have found Dr. Becker's message well appointed. To hear more lessons like this one, visit our website at www.steamboatchurch.org or come see us at 1698 Lincoln Avenue in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Bible classes are Sunday mornings at 9.30, 
and worship services are at 1030. We look forward to meeting you. Until then, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.